Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for the Kaleidoscope National Juried Exhibition Artist Talk. We have uh, eight artists that have signed up to talk about their artwork that is in the exhibition at Art Gallery in San Francisco. Uh, my name is Stephen C. Wagner. I'm the managing partner of Art Gallery. Uh, along with uh, Michael Yoakum and Priscilla Otani. Uh, we have Diane Hoffman, who's our house manager, and she's helping us out tonight as well. And thank you, Diane, for assisting us as co-host. So we're going to hear from eight artists tonight. So before we get started, let me show you a few images of the exhibition. So this is our main gallery at ARC. And as you can tell, there's quite a variety of artwork, different sizes, different colors. And then we have quite a few uh, three-dimensional pieces and smaller pieces that are uh, included in the exhibition. So we're ready to get started and meet the artists. Unfortunately, Jonathan Gaber, who is the first artist, was not able to join us tonight. Um, this is his work. It's very colorful and bright. And unfortunately, he won't be able to talk about his work. So the next artist that we're going to hear from is Heather Galloway. So Heather, if you could unmute yourself, tell us where you're joining us from. Tell us a little bit about your art process and your piece that's in the exhibition. Hi, uh, my name's Heather uh, Galloway. I'm joining you from Sacramento, California. Um, the piece I entered into uh, Kaleidoscope was a part of a series that I had started called um, Lay of the Land. Um, each piece is kind of centered around the idea of a landscape. It's not so um, direct in its communication. It's sort of if you could just when you're reaching for something in your mind and trying to remember a space, it's it's that idea is what I'm constantly striving to uh, achieve with my work. I am obviously heavily influenced by color. Um, I The more varied my palette, the more excited I am. I really enjoy um, the juxtaposition of colors next to each other and kind of the energy that that creates in the mood. Um, the piece in the show, uh, was one of the larger pieces I had done in my time. And um, I really enjoyed it because it really allowed me to kind of use the negative space of the work also, which is something that I have struggled with too, is how much do I want to leave out? How much do I want to, uh, you know, keep going? But with this one, I felt it was really important having the wood background to sort of have it read as wood. I really appreciated the way that the two um, materials were, you know, speaking to each other in a way. So I just, um, I draw a lot of my inspiration from the landscape and from looking at things, but I, I, I don't consider myself a landscape artist. I consider myself an abstract artist. And there's also sort of um, a little bit of a nod to sort of a, a, a muscular tendon or something kind of pulling the sort of tension. And all of my pieces are really just sort of intuitively led. I don't really start out with something in mind. I just kind of follow one color to the next color and um, allow them to sort of lead me to my next choice. And really, I just appreciate the process of painting and the feeling of laying pigment down. With this piece, there's a combination of a hard pastel and latex and acrylic paint. And so the hard pastel um, can be kind of tricky to work with. It can really pose some um, issues with wanting to get the opacity that I want. But Overall, I really enjoy the challenge. I think that it, it um, is making me grow as an artist to sort of branch out beyond paint and just kind of do something really um, hands-on with it. And um, yeah, so this particular piece, when I look at it or we, when I when I thought of it after I stepped back, because I don't generally think too much while I'm doing, I don't know if anybody else is like that as an artist, but I don't have a, a framework typically. Um, but once I saw it, I thought this is 100% a California sunset driving at the end of the day, looking at the mountain ranges and the different layers of dirt and the different uh, ways that the horizon meet the land. And um, I just really, um, it kind of just opened that up for me. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm kind of on a wavelength here with thinking about the land and California spaces and how they're, you know, we get kind of used to them, but they are finite. And so I made this correlation between um, the way that our landscapes are kind of like disappearing and changing and shifting, but then also the way that we remember things and how those memories can shift and change. And so there's a, there's a little bit of a relationship between, you know, an, an actual change in things and then a, a, a mental 
um, thought process about thought process behind it. So about change. So, but thank you for um, having me here and letting me talk about my work. I appreciate it. Okay, Heather, thank you so much for sharing us, uh, sharing with us uh, more insight into your artwork. Um, so we have uh, a couple questions. Um, so you said that you work intuitively. You lay down the first color first. So do you have colors in mind or do you lay out colors in advance? Um, I do typically uh, start with like a, a palette that it, things that are just kind of like I'm excited about. Um, and then I sort of let it roll from there and move into the next one. Okay. And on here, you you said you're exposing the wood. Do you not normally not do that? Or is this something typical of your work? This is a, a departure. Normally my work is end to end. Everything is covered. I don't even leave um, any negative space. So this was a sort of a new new way for me to sort of interpret. I think the wood is what really kind of inspired me. I kind of just liked that negative space and the energy that it was kind of pulling and pushing and the tension there. Yeah, and you have a few little windows in between the streams of colors. So what inspired you to do that? You know, I that's kind of how I start some of the shapes is I outline them and then I slowly start to fill them in the way that you would have when you're a child and you're doing a coloring or something. And I did a did one and I just kind of looked at it. I stepped back, which is something I have to remind myself to do is to step away from my work for a second and really look at the whole thing. Um, and I just felt like, you know what, I, I like the way that this is reading. So I just left a few of them in there and I felt like it really worked well to create kind of like a dynamic, um, yeah, view there. Okay. Okay, Heather. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening and talking about your art. And we're so happy to have you in the exhibition. Thank you for having me. Okay. Okay, so the next artist we're going to hear from is Heather Heitzenrather. And Hi Heather, if you go ahead and uh, unmute yourself, introduce yourself, tell us a little, where you're joining us from, uh, tell us a little bit about your process and your work in the exhibition. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Heather Heitzenrather. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, so what I do is I paint really colorful works. Uh, uh, with oil painting, um, usually typically featuring the, uh, a figure. Most of my work uh, incorporates uh, reflective mylar. Uh, in the background, I like to paint a lot of reflective surfaces to kind of create a surreal world uh, that my figures kind of inhabit. Uh, and with this piece that was in Kaleidoscope, um, it was a part of um, one part of four series that I did. and. Uh, each shape is a, a part of the suit of cards. Uh, this one here, uh, clairvoyance, uh, is the suit of hearts. Um, and with each one, I was trying to depict a different aspect of um, magic that we have um, as humans and different ways that we um, perceive magic. Um, so with this one here, I was uh, thinking about inspiration and ideas. And that's kind of what like the butterflies symbolize. Um, and I was, at the time I was reading a book about um, inspiration and how ideas want to, they want to exist, they want to happen. And if someone doesn't do the idea or do the inspiration, then it kind of moves on to the next person until someone does it. So that's kind of what like the butterflies uh, represented. Um, and I like a lot of color in my work. Um, all of my pieces I set up um, a photo shoot for in my studio. I uh, hang up the mylar and I put different colored lights on and set up any of um, props. And then um, I work from those photographs. Um, also the shape panels, um, I make them myself. They're all on wood. Uh, so yeah, I also like to make everything very realistic. And I was so excited about the show um, for the theme color. Um, a lot of things on the East Coast here, uh, they like the Appalachia theme with everything's earthy. So um, I was really excited to um, be a part of a West Coast show featured uh, featuring color. So um, thank you uh, for having me and let me talk about my work.
Okay, Heather, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so we have a few questions. If anyone has a question for Heather or any of the artists, you may type those into the chat room. So Heather, why did you decide to do the four different suits of cards? Um, I think at the time, I was also kind of like looking into tarot cards as well. Um, and there's so much symbolism within just like a regular deck of cards. Um, and if there's like four suits for the four seasons, um, if you add up all the card numbers, it's uh, 365, uh, like in the number of days in a year. And there's just so much like historic references with the cards and they've been around for so long. Um, and also too, like that, this uh, series kind of went along with um, the idea of magic. And um, the first one I did of this four part series was the spade and it was um, of just like a regular magician um, and talking about that aspect of magic. So that's kind of how like the cards came into play. Okay, and why do you choose Mylar for the background? Um, whenever I was in art school, um, taking painting classes, I could not paint um, reflective material and I had a hard time with it and that drove me nuts. <laughs> I didn't like not being able to do something. So I really um, focused on different reflective materials. I started with bottles, coffee cans, then I moved on to water. And then someone showed me um, reflective mylar and um, I bought a roll of it and I felt like no one was really doing it at the time. Um, and I've been painting it since. I've been um, kind of working on the series since 2014 and it's almost been 10 years of painting mylar and I just love it. I love how it breaks um, colors and shape down and it makes kind of like abstract in real life. Oh, great, Heather. Thank you for sharing that with us. I just want to note that Heather was one of the three artists that won a Juris Choice Award in the exhibition. So congratulations um, for uh, your award. Thanks, I'm so excited. Okay, great. So thank you for participating and sharing so much uh, information about your piece. So the next artist that we're gonna hear from is Mark Lightfoot. So Mark, if you go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from. Tell us a little bit about your art process and your piece that's in the exhibition. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Lightfoot, and I'm speaking to you from my studio in Oakland, California, West Oakland. Um, I've been an artist uh, painting and printmaking for many, many years. And a few years ago, about seven years ago, I became aware of a new material through uh, visiting a place called a stained glass garden in Berkeley and uh, with a friend who was doing mosaics. And I started to see these really interesting painterly things that were done with glass. And I got very intrigued with it. So uh, what this basically is that I'm working with, with glass is fused glass. It's not glass that you bl uh, blow and put in a, a forge. It's really a, a kind of, it's, it's put in a kiln after you create the design. So all the pieces are cut and assembled. And then you do through various different kinds of firings, you create different effects depending on the kind of schedule you have and work with. It's a very technical kind of process, but it has uh, really, in, uh, it's really excited me and kind of invigorated my process. The piece that's in the show N comes out of a lot of my uh, feelings about being in nature and natural processes and structures and forms. And a lot of that is just intuitively arrived at when I start working on a piece I normally don't have a fixed goal. I basically begin by uh, assembling colors that I like to work with as a painter. And glass is very reflective and very bright. So working with these challenges, um, I allow the piece just to, the process of making the piece results in the piece. There just comes a point when I feel like this piece is done. This particular one I called N because when I finished with it, I could I could suddenly see that there was a, a sort of a letter N in it. Sometimes my titles just come about very uh, mm, stream of consciousness almost. So the work that I do is oftentimes each piece is very different, but it basically does work. I work with with the glass. I work with bold colors and shapes, and there's always strong and energetic movement in my pieces which to me emulates the kind of motion and rhythm 
that you see in nature and natural forms. Um, frankly, I'm really in awe of interconnectedness I see in nature. And it is frankly this wonder and beauty that I see there that I would like to convey to you the person who's looking at the piece. Um, that's really all I have to say about it at this point. Um, each piece that I do has very different effects. Sometimes I have a lot more clear glass shining through. There are ways you can use textures to create all kinds of different natural effects like water, wind, and so on. So uh, I just want to thank you very much for inviting me to uh, talk about my work and uh, thank you for joining. Okay, Mark, thank you so much for uh, sharing us uh, with us uh, your process for your piece. Again, if there's any questions, uh, you can type them into the chat. I have the chat box open. I can see it if you uh, type it in now. And Mark, um, I noticed that the piece here is kind of symmetrical, that on each side there's uh, a clear, almost uh, iridescent glass. So did you choose to do that on purpose or was that just a happenstance? Well, actually, it did evolve when I started to pull this piece together. I had a lot of action and color going on in the middle, and I began to feel that I wanted more of a quieter bracketing of this energetic center part. So I began to see kind of quieter, more translucent and transparent shapes on the side to kind of bracket the energetic centerpiece, which is almost a cross shape. So as a way of kind of giving the eye relief and also allowing the colors in the middle to sort of come forward and be kind of like the star of the show. Okay, so another question is how do you work with reactive glass? Is that a challenge for you or do you plan for it? Uh, well, reactive glass is uh, when you basically have colors that have different uh, chemical foundations. So if you have a copper or a... Um, sulfur-based uh, color, they react when they, I think that's in my understanding you, Stephen, when you're asking about that. Yes. <laughs> so then uh, when you get a reaction, it means these two glasses join or touch and they create a, a reaction at the edge, which creates a, a sort of a strong, uh, usually a dark brown color, which you can incorporate into the design. If you know that you've got these two colors, Basically, copper colors are basically green, blue greens, and uh, sulfur colors are the yellows, the oranges, and the reds. So when you're working with those colors adjoining each other, they will create this surprising uh, addition to the design just by their touching and reacting. Okay, thanks for explaining that. And then the colors that you choose, do you have uh, pieces of glass all laid out and then you just have an idea in mind of, of what you want to combine the colors? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I get a lot of my most interesting ideas when I have, I, you know, over the making of glass, you end up with a lot of bits and scraps and pieces of many, many colors. And I sort of have that semi-organized. So when I go to start a piece, I will just pull some out of my various baskets of shards and bits, and I'll start to put them down and the more the more random and broken they are, it's the challenge of making pulling them together into a structure. So what to me, like what nature sometimes appears chaotic underneath it, there is this internal structure. And that's kind of what I will look for. And I will also create when I work with pieces, a sort of balancing of warm and cool colors, bright and soft. Um, in this particular one, you'll see how the white kind of draws you around throughout the piece. It relieves the bright colors, as does the more translucent pieces at the edge with a pale, with a, with a transparent blue. So I'm always kind of playing back and forth, creating this sense of movement between strong and soft, bold and quiet when I'm working with the pieces. Okay, Mark, thank you so much for giving us uh, so much more uh, information about how you process and make your pieces. Thank you for participating. Uh, we had two pieces of glass work in our exhibition, and it's so nice to have one of yours. Thank you. Okay, and so the next artist we're going to hear from is Bao Kang Lu. So Bao, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself, and tell us where you're joining us from. Uh, tell us about your process and the piece that's in the exhibition. Thanks, Stephen. 
Um, my name is Bao Kang Lu. I am talking to you from San Francisco. I'm just down the street from the, um, the gallery. But um, the piece I have in Kaleidoscope is part of a series called Mistral. And it comes from a negative space, um, basically in reaction to what seems to be a swing back from the progressive uh, the progressive strides we've made in society as a whole, especially since 2016. So there's like this sense of betrayal, sense of dread that I have. Um, but really it, it concentrates on how the capacity for human compassion is limited. That's, that's the focus of the, the series. Um, it sounds a bit goth and emo, um, I've outgrown that, but so I, I want to, it, it, the, the world is sad enough. So I want to bring it, bring it back to a happier place. So drawing from my, my one of my favorite places in the world is uh, Marblehead, Massachusetts. I would visit the town every summer uh, with friends and stay in this house perched on the cliff of this cove, this beautiful cove. And if you walk out on any balcony, you can look down straight into the water, into the ocean. And basically the Mistral series is my abstraction of that view of the cove at low tide. And it uh, reveals all the flotsam and jetsam, all the debris, the broken glass, the seaweed and little creatures, sea creatures. Um, so this is an abstract painting, but there's one small element in there that is not abstract. And that's a tiny, tiny little lady crab. They're endemic to the Eastern coast. Um, and it's, it's painted as realistically as I can get it with like a fine, fine, fine um, paintbrush. So the other uh, thing that makes this stand out is the, the techniques I use to paint. It's primarily blown acrylic. So I water down my acrylic as much as I can without it uh, breaking up too much. And then using a straw of and, and other implements, the straws are different sizes, and also a hair dryer. And then I've also needed, as, as my splotches got bigger, I needed to get something that blows harder. So I got a pet hair dryer. So the bigger the splotch is, the, the more air I need. Um, but trying to indulge in, in art making that it's happy in order to bring, bring back the negativity and convert something that's, that's negative into something that's beautiful. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a comment on the limits of human compassion, but I made it beautiful. <laughs> okay, Bao, thank you so much for uh, sharing some insight into your piece here. Um, could you tell us why you chose a circle shape for this work? Oh, so, the circles are kind of, they're, they're, they're like portals. So it's like portals into another world. So you can think of this as if like we're looking into, into the world of this little crab. So um, the crab is supposed to be symbolic of, of a person, of the, the, the selfish person. So it's like, it's them and the world. And so they're, and their actions and the way they react to the world, it's, it's, it says if they're this is their world and they don't think of anything else beyond that. So and why did you choose to, uh, this unique or how did you come to this unique uh, pr process of um, blowing and spreading the paint? That's a technique that I, I used when I was a child and I thought that you know it's like bring something that's fun back to something that's negative. So okay. and when you say that you use a straw or using your own breath? I did. Um, so I also have, um, I also in my past life was a, a power lifter. And part of power lifting is that really uh, is breath control so that you can lift very, very heavy weights. So that helped me in blowing the viscous, even though it's watered down, viscous paint and making those splotches. Um, yeah, so um, lots of technique there. <laughs> I, if if only I could have done that when I was a child, but no, it's like I, it started off as um, a technique that I used as a child. Okay, and can we identify where the crab is on this piece? You can't. It's in the bottom right. It's orange. It's the only thing that's bright orange. It's um, it, yeah, bottom right. 
kind of like at the four four o'clock position. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, participating in the artist talk tonight and in the exhibition, and uh, we appreciate you um, and your full explanation on your process. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Okay, and so the next artist we're going to hear from is Jennifer Sharkey. So Jennifer, go ahead and introduce, uh, unmute yourself, introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, a little bit about your process and the piece that's in the exhibition. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Jennifer Sharkey, and I'm from Asheville. If you don't know where that is, it's in the Blue Ridge Mountains in Western North Carolina. Um, art's always been a big part of my life, but I started specifically focusing on dot art about six years ago. And I call the type of dot art that I do geometric dotalism. And I say geometric because the majority of my work now is of um, fractaline or flowering mandalas, much like the piece that I have in the show that I call Pinwheel. Um, my process starts with a vision and then a mathematical compass. So many people ask me if I have some sort of template or stencil that I use to plot my mandalas, and the answer is no. <laughs> I only use a compass and a ruler, and sometimes I don't use anything at all. I'll just start in the middle, and I'll see where it takes me. Um, but for Pinwheel, I did have an initial vision and a specific idea that I wanted to share with everybody, and that is I wanted to remind everybody of their inner child of that playful, whimsical side of themselves that speaks and, or who speaks and acts without fear. And I wanted everybody to remember a time when they were effortlessly and just naturally present in the moment. I've always been fascinated by humans' search for enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment, and I aim to make art that helps them in that journey, but also keeps them grounded and centered at the same time. Do you ever have a moment when you're by yourself, maybe you're driving in your car and all of a sudden you have this overwhelming feeling of joy and thankfulness. And maybe you don't know where it's coming from because perhaps you're having a bad day, but regardless, in that moment, you feel like you are exactly where you're supposed to be. That's the feeling that I want to portray in my art. That calm confidence that you, confidence of knowing that you are on the right path. I think I'll end there. <laughs> thank you so much again for being here and thank you for listening, uh, letting me talk about my art. <laughs> Okay, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, so you talked about your uh, your process. So um, do you always do a round uh, surface like uh, Bao does? No, no, I often, um, this is one of the first pieces I actually did on a cradled piece of round wood. I usually um, would do like this a circle in the square. Okay, it works very well as a circle. So the colors, that you use, they, they look like uh, tertiary colors, like teals and purples and the mm -hmm. salmon yes. colors. So do you plan your colors out in advance or is that more of an instinctual? Um, sometimes I do plan them in advance. And when I do that, I try to use like a discord color. Okay. And like somebody comments, somebody comments that it reminds them of peacock's feathers. Did you have <laughs> that in mind? I didn't when I didn't, um, but I see that now. <laughs> and there's also a sense of three dimensionality where the um, arches are darker towards the center and lighter towards the outside. So was that on purpose as well? Yes, yes, it was. I wanted to create movement, and that was the best way that I I figured I could do that. Okay. And is this a flat surface or concave or convex? It's flat. It's flat. Okay. Well, it's a beautiful piece. Uh, so thank you uh, for participating in the artist talk this evening and sharing so much about your inspiration and process. Thank you so much.
Okay, and then the next artist we're going to hear from is Liz Vaughn. So Liz, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from. Tell us a little bit about your process and the piece that's in the exhibition. Hi, uh, I'm Liz Vaughn. I am joining you from Tucson, Arizona. And um, so happy to be here with everyone who's so talented. <laughs> I feel a little overwhelmed. Um, my piece in this show is uh, an oil painting. Uh, it's called uh, Beauty Masks and Trade Secrets. And um, there was quite a debacle in shipping it there. So I was considering adding something to the title like shipping anomalies with it. However, it's um, really kind of a tongue in cheek. Uh, last year, I had a solo show at a historical gallery in Tucson. I was painting a piece and it just kind of went wrong and I ended up blacking out the background and eventually just drawing this yellow line circle-ish around the figure and it worked so well I think it, it kind of triggered something um, you know for future work which is what happened in this piece as well. Um, I've also started going in my work I, I went more graphic and now I'm I'm really going back to my roots, which are more loose and, um, you know, more free painterly. So I might have um, some pencil in there or there might be chalk pastel, there might be writing in there. Um, just something that's really more free form and more exciting to me. The graphic stuff, I, I so admire it and I feel like it's stunning but it wasn't like making me on fire. So that's kind of how I segued into this. And I feel like, you know, if something's pulling you that passion that you should just dive in and kind of do it. Um, the technical process, which I think uh, maybe I talked about a little bit, um, I usually sketch, which would be in just a regular graphite um, mechanical pencil always free form, never uh, with the projector, and then usually an acrylic underpainting and then oil, layers of oil on top. Okay, Liz, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so someone's asking if this is a self-portrait. <laughs> I actually get that question a lot. Um, I am very, very drawn to the female figure and almost all of my figurative work is is almost always women. Um, I think in the early days, there were a lot of self-portraits many years ago, but not so much now. I think it the two just kind of, you know, meshed around and now we just have this signature style that either they look like me or I look like them. I'm not sure which <laughs> is the case. And do you paint from a photograph or is this something that's more in your mind? So for me, um, I keep sort of a running dialogue of words and phrases and things that are just, uh, words are just fascinating to me. So I, I have a lot of that tumbling around. Sometimes it's more the, the word before or, or the phrase before the image. So I do look at other work for inspiration um, and I'm very much uh interested in abstract obviously expressionism um all of it really uh, i think all of it finds inspiration in your in your piece um and hopefully comes together in a way maybe not necessarily with the beauty mask but something that just is passionate for you okay and somebody's asking if you're following your passion more so now than with your graphics yeah, yeah. I mean, it. it is, I'd say, a little scary. You know, when I look at this and then I, I look at other people's work, I'm thinking, you know, they're just so different from each other. But this is what, you know, this is what speaks to me and really fires me up to look. I may not always do this particular 
you know, loose abstraction, but I think one feeds on another. And then next thing you know, all of these elements are coming into play in like a completely new style. Okay, so thank you so much, Liz, for uh, participating in that exhibition and participating in the talk this evening. Uh, it was you. a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you. Okay, and so the next artist we're going to hear from is Nanette Wild. So Nanette, if you go ahead and unmute yourself, introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, tell us a little bit about your art process and the piece that's in the exhibition. Oh, thanks, Stephen, and thanks everybody for coming out tonight to hear us all talk about our work. I'm located on the San Francisco Peninsula. I'm an art educator, uh, a writer, as well as a practicing artist and a curator and a publisher. But the piece that I am exhibiting with ARC for Kaleidoscope is one of 50 uh, unique monoprints called On Longing. So I tend to work in series, and this is the series On Longing, uh, which is titled after a book by Susan Stewart, who is an um, art historian and philosopher and theorist. Each of the prints are mandala, which contemplates and celebrate the natural world. The work is meant to reflect upon global mass extinctions, habitat loss, biodiversity, environmental stewardship, sustainability, and impacts of the human built environment on ecosystems and life forms of the natural world. So the monoprint process that I'm, and these are uh, 20 by 20 on Reeves BFK. I use oil-based ink and I roll out um, a sheet on a sheet of plexiglass um, a flat of color, and the process is using a uh, a stencil that I've designed in software, and then cut with a laser, and that's how I get the. Um, I don't want to say perfection because it's hardly perfect, but that's how I'm based on a circular form because they're mandalas, and I sandwich that plexiglass sheet, then the stencil, and then the printmaking paper which has also been soaked in water and it's run through an etching press. And I do that repeatedly, um, sometimes using the same stencil twice, which gives a different value to the ink. Um, so I just keep doing that repeatedly and repeatedly until I ended up with 50 prints, of which this is the first from the series. So I had made a goal because I'm an educator. Oftentimes my summers would be the only time that I would have to really focus in on my art practice. And so one summer I made a goal to do 10 of these and I was having so much fun in the studio that I decided to keep going. So I went for a whole year to end up with the 50 monoprints. And uh, I guess I could say more about the, what I was thinking about. I was wondering if I could make work about our global situation of mass extinctions that was not negative, sappy, or in your face political. So I'm personally affected by the fact that African elephants are expected to be eliminated from Africa any minute now, if the current rate of poaching for ivory continues. And then we have these huge issues of surrounding colony collapse disorder for one of our primary pollinators, which is bees. So I wanted to make work that was positive about such losses, hoping to bring attention to celebrate non-human life um, to these issues without being slapping people in the face. Okay, so, okay. so Nanette, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, you <laughs> mentioned this is your first out of 50 pieces. So how did these evolve over time? Well, uh, I started kind of with random shapes and uh, very randomly started printing. Um, and sometimes the stencils would be destroyed in the printing process, so they wouldn't be able to be reused. But as I kept layering ink, so every color you see there is a different run through the press. As I kept developing each print, uh, I had to start making very distinct decisions to how to satisfy the image and complete it. So it, I had them up in my studio wall and I would take uh, 
you know, after a while I'd say, well, I'm going to print brown today and which ones would benefit from brown and what stencils would I use? So it was um, serendipitous, but a lot of looking, a lot of considering and, you know, thinking about the formal qualities as well as the content of the work. Okay, Nanette, well, thank you so much for uh, participating in the exhibition and the artist talk tonight. So we thank uh, all the artists for participating in the artist talk tonight uh, and sharing uh, more inspiration into their pieces and more enlightenment into their process. And thank you to all of you who joined us. I hope you enjoyed hearing from the artists. Take care and thank you. Good night.